what I'm going to try to do is a little bit different. I'm going to present um, all right. Try, try to present this um, general problem of motion planning and some strategies that have been um, developed in the by the community. Um, I will um, show some of my own work, but I'll also try to um, show approaches of others and identify what I think are some of the current challenges for a few application areas. So first off, here's a brief overline of, outline of what I'll talk about. Um, basically, motivation, what is motion planning? Then I'll try to go over some brief definitions and theoretical preliminaries. Then some this two strategies, basically sampling-based planning, and there's kind of two flavors of it. I'll go over those briefly. And then I'll try to show some applications to um, a few areas. So first off, motion planning. Was there a pointer up here? Is that one? Yeah, OK. So um, motion planning, the basic definition is you have some movable object and you have a description of the environment, and what you want to do is Am I doing that? That was a mic. I don't think it was me, though. Oh, you think? I put it on. Well, we'll see if it happens again. Um, and you're given some, typically some start and goal configuration, and what you're looking for is a sequence of valid configurations that'll take you from your start to your goal. What's shown here is this um, alpha puzzle problem. You've probably seen it's two twisted nails. Um, I used to travel with it, but now it's, um, they often take it from me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's basically, you, you need to get them in this, uh, you'll see, let's see, right here, there's this one special configuration that you need to, to get before you can separate them. So the, the field originally grew out of people trying to do motion planning or path planning for robots. But there's a lot of other applications of it. And before going into it, I'd like to um, mention some of these applications or extensions of it. And you have moving obstacles. So, so when people first started studying this problem, there was a static environment. You had one robot, and it was a rigid body. Um, you can have moving obstacles. You may have actually deformable robots. You have something that has a tether to it, you know, some kind of a cable. Um, multiple robots, um, lots of different kinds of constraints, like how it might move, say, a car. Um, you have uncertainty in your model. You don't really know precisely how big things are or where they are. They may have moved. Um, and then there are different types of tasks. So now I just want to give you a few examples of where motion planning arises. Um, well, it, it's like, think of it like a car. And it turns, there are constraints on how it can move, basically. You can't just move it anywhere you would like. Um, there's, uh, he, there's this um, intelligent CAD application. So, so these are all problems that arise, arose from GE. Um, this, is, this is one problem. This is an aircraft engine. And there's this one part here that's circled. And it's, it's, it's the same part, part here. Um, they had a design constraint that they needed to be able to remove that part within a certain amount of time so for basically you know, repair conditions. And you can see that the, there are these pipes that are wrapped around here, and they've been bent. And that was because the, the engineer who designed it thought the way that this part could be removed is basically could be um, you know, kind of rotated in place and then came out. Well, it turned out using an uh, automatic motion planner that that wasn't necessary. It could, there was a way to just kind of pull it out without doing that type of motion. So they didn't need to put those bends into the pipes. This is an example where they designed this, this assembly here, and they decided not to go with it in manufacture because in their, the ability that they were able to test it, they were not able to be sure. They knew that they could make the two parts separately, but they weren't sure that it was possible to actually put them together. And then our planner found that it they could have actually gone with that design. 
So it's in, that's in terms of like testing and, and for designing them for maintainability. This also could have a lot of applications in, for example, training. So if you have these part removal or assembly um, trajectories, you could show them to the mechanics or the people you're trying to chain in some you know, virtual or augmented reality environment. Another place where motion planning comes in is planning for digital actors. And it has been, unfortunately, not used as to the degree that it could have been used in many of these uh, motion pictures. But um, here we have a model of a robot and a baby, and we're applying motion capture data, the data that was captured for a boxer, to both of them. Here's a, another one. This doesn't look as cute, but this is actually a pretty hard problem. You have this articulated linkage here that you're trying to trace out those letters on this wall. So you're trying to maintain this contact, and so it's, it's, that's actually a pretty difficult problem. What were the constraints of the boxers? I don't understand the problem. Like, where were the constraints? Well, the, they're not, the skeletons are not identical. And you have to apply the same motion. Basically, you have this motion that you've captured from this motion capture data, and you're trying to apply it to these skeletals, skeletons that are similar. You know, these ones are actually pretty similar, but they don't necessarily even have all the same numbers of you know, links, say. Um, in this problem, we have multiple agents. So here we have a whole bunch of agents that are trying to move, traverse through this narrow passage. Here we have two sets of agents. One, the shepherd who's trying to, to herd this set of agents. Um, in, so he's trying to get them in there, and they're just trying to stay together and stay away from him. Uh, let's see. Why isn't that one? Okay. It's, well, I thought I had mostly fixed these things. But this is a, an evacuation simulation. It's a multi-story building, and there's a bunch of agents here. And they're trying to get out to these blue areas, which are, um, you know, these are like the exits, that the, the exits which they can leave the building, and they're trying to collect out here in this safe area. But their, their constraints are they need to avoid collision with each other and to navigate to where they're trying to go. Here we have a case where the objects are actually deformable. So here's the same path, and this teapot and this ducky are following the same kind of nominal path, but they have to devoid, uh, deform to avoid collision with this. This is an example. I, I had an animation. I can't get it to play, unfortunately. This is um, from some work from some colleagues where this was actually a needle trajectory planning for um, uh, delivering a medicine to an area of a tumor. And they're trying to avoid um, these red areas. So basically, they need to plan a trajectory between these right places here and avoid these red areas. Say those might be vital organs or something. And the, the needle is deformable. Here's another kind of problem. These are molecules. So these are protein molecules, and this is an a image of a, a RNA molecule. And they're both um, movable and flexible, and they're trying to, both of them are trying to get to their stable configuration. Now these are all actually different um, versions of the same basic motion planning problem, and what I want to do next is show you basically the, some, an underlying framework which, which allows us to put all these problems into the same space called configuration space, and then we are allowed to basically develop algorithms to plan in that configuration space. So here's the um, definition of configuration space. How, how many of you are actually familiar with it? Okay, not too many. All right. So um, in this space, on my movable object, I'll, call, I'll probably call it the robot often, uh, maps to a point in this higher dimensional space. And we have a parameter for each degree of freedom of the robot. So here's some examples down here. So if I have a point in three-dimensional space, my configuration space is actually just the same. It's another x, y, z coordinates. If I have a rigid body in th three-dimensional space, um, I have a six-dimensional configuration space. So if we have like this, this eraser here, um, if I know the position of one corner of this, that doesn't tell me precisely what it looks like. There's all these other orientational values. So I need three additional values for that. Um, for this little manipulator, imagine that it's um, fixed in the plane of the screen, and this is a fixed base. 
but it can rotate about that, that angle, this angle, and this angle. So it has a three-dimensional configuration space. And for the model of the proteins that we work with, um, it will have, if the protein has, say, N amino acids, we use two degrees of freedom for each amino acid. It's called these phi psi angles. And so if I have a relatively small protein that ha may have, say, 100 um, amino acids, it'll have you know, 200 dimensional configuration space. So is it clear what configuration space is? Okay, so now that doesn't say anything about, so now a point in this space can represent some configuration of my movable object. It doesn't tell us whether or not it's valid. And for that, we need basically some check on it. For most of those examples I showed you, validity would be tested by doing a collision detection. For the mo molecule problems, we are actually looking for or computing some energy of the conformation. And the lower the energy, the, the more stable the, or better the configuration is. And of higher value might mean that it's infeasible. But typically, that's also re related to geometric um, considerations. So the configuration space now is a set of all possible positions. And we have these configuration space obstacles, which are the in set of infeasible ones. This is just a two-dimensional configuration space, which none of these ha here have. But um, what this shows is I might have like an obstacle in the workspace that translates into the configuration space. So this, this podium here is an obstacle in the workspace. And if I'm the robot, I can't show you a po uh, one of those infeasible placements, but it would be like my arm through the podium. And the table here is another obstacle. There would be a configuration where I might collide with both the podium and the table here, and that would correspond to the configuration space obstacles corresponding to the table and the, and the podium overlap. Okay? So now we can think about now motion planning in this configuration space. So here's a simple example to show the, the correspondence between planning in the workspace and planning in configuration space. Here I have this simple 2D place. I have my robot is a triangle and I want to go from like this configuration to that configuration. These are obstacles. Um, the first thing to note is that unfortunately these nice simple obstacles in the workspace got translated into some pretty nasty obstacles in the configuration space. Um, the, the good news though is my point, my robot now, which no matter what it was here, it's now point over in the configuration space. And in the two spaces here, my path was this swept volume of the triangle going from here to here. Now it's just this you know, one-dimensional you know, trajectory. So um, the idea is if you can have um, come up with a way to map your problem into configuration space, and now we have algorithms that work in configuration space, we can apply them to any problem that we wish. So. Um, Unfortunately, uh, motion planning is, is hard. Um, and t to date, the best deterministic solutions we have, general solutions, were from John Kenney's PhD thesis. And honestly, they're only practical for problems that have dimensions like four or five. So even this rigid body in three dimensions, this really simple case, we can't ha you know, plan for exactly. So what do we do? we have turned our attention to randomized or probabilistic methods. And basically what we're doing here is we're trading off the, our, our you know, full completeness of the planner to know for sure whether or not there's a solution and what that solution is for something that gives us some kind of probabilistic guarantee and a major gain in efficiency. And the set of methods that I'm going to talk to you about today are these so-called sampling-based methods. And for us, this probabilistic completeness guarantee typically means that if you sample enough, you're guaranteed that eventually you will converge to the solution. Well, that's basically what I said. It means that, the way it means is that if we sample enough, so you'll see what sample means when I show you the method, that you will be guaranteed that you will eventually converge on the solution. But that eventually could be very long in some problems. So that's what I'm going to do now is kind of talk about these two, st the sampling-based planning and these kind of two major um, ways of applying it. And there seems to be no clock here. Do they know how I'm coming? Okay. I think it may be okay. You can signal me. 
So um, there's these kind of two flavors, multiple query planning or single query planning. So in multiple query planning, you want to do some work so that you're going to eventually be solving many different queries in this same environment. So you can afford to do some pre-processing first to make those easy. Um, in the single query planning, you're only going to solve one query, so you don't want to do a whole lot of extra work that's not related to solving that particular query. So um, I'm going to talk about these multiple query methods first. And the method that's kind of become uh, the most, the overall strategy that's become, I would say, one of the most um, powerful methods today is this probabilistic roadmap methods. And it was developed independently by Lydia Kavraki and Jean-Claude Latome in her PhD thesis, and Petr Sveska and Mark Overmars in Petr's PhD thesis. And so t we tend to um, cite the joint journal article on that. But it works the following. It's really simple, beautiful algorithm. What we do is in the first step, we're going to build this thing called a roadmap, which is basically a graph which is supposed to encode the connectivity of our space. In the first step, we're just going to randomly generate configurations. And each one I generate, I'm going to test it to see if it's valid. And I'm going to throw away the ones that are not valid. Then um, for each sample that I've retained, I'm going to try to connect it to some small number, typically 5, 10, 20, of its nearest neighbors. And generally what we do in that connection is we test intermediate configurations along the straight line be connecting them for validity. Why do you dot the side of an optical divide if it's not valid? That's why it's red. Oh, red. Yeah. So I kept the blue ones, and I threw away the red ones. Oh. OK. Um, but I, I didn't know they were invalid until I generated and tested them. And similarly, this connection is dotted red because it's invalid. Because at some point I tested one of the intermediate configurations on it and it was invalid. So after I do this independently for each one of those, I end up with some graph we call the roadmap. And that's my pre-processing. Now when it comes time to query processing, I now have my start and goal configurations. I try to connect them to the roadmap, and then I pull out a path. I search for a path in my roadmap. So first off, you can see that this is certainly not guaranteed to give you the best path between the start and goal configuration. You could say whether or not it's giving you the best or shortest path in your roadmap. Um, but the, the, the objective really is just to find a path, not necessarily find the best path in these problems. Yeah, but this is the method, and the only thing you need to do this is this, you need to be able to sample points and test them for validity. Those are the only two primitives you need to do this. Um, so this was really a revolutionary method when it came through. There were a lot of these, you know, what today we view are very simple pro um, problems, these, you know, linkages with, you know, 50 links that people couldn't plan for, and they could do it very easily f in, in using this method. They're probably complete, and here you can probably see what that means. That means if you sample densely enough that this network that you're going to get, this graph you'll get, will represent the connectivity of your space. Yeah, that's true, because let's say something can just barely, barely make it exactly, then probably zero you'll find exactly, exactly. that point. Yeah, so yeah. Not, yeah, that's one. Well, um, you will if you sample it so completely. Well, okay. It, exactly in the yeah, okay. If there's one actual configuration that you need, yes. But um, that's not usually so. The, the guarantees that we have been able to prove about these things is you prove something about like the percentage of the free configuration that free configuration space that's visible from any one of your samples. Um, so, in this case. Well, I'll, I'll let me show you some of the problems with this. Um, so, so they were v revolutionary and they worked really well, and you could solve a lot of them today. So that's it. Well, 
it's, it's not really, right? And in, in, in some sense, you can think, and that's the original, the, basically the stuff I showed you is treating it exactly that way. It's just treating it as kind of a mesh. That is, instead of this you know, single linkage, I have this mesh. But there are different types of physical properties that are going on. Right now, it's just really a, a geometric constraint we have on what are the allowable angle configurations, et cetera. We need to basically bring more. In reality, you, these things essentially have almost an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So if you really want to treat it accurately, that is where you end up this computational problem. So what's kind of an appropriate um, way to model this? You know, I think probably some hierarchical strategy where you put a greater level of detail in the part <coughs> at the particular time that needs it. So, um, well, the polyhedral objects was just a simplification for, you know, this talk. Um, the the t objects aren't going to be like that. Now, the piecewise linear path, yes, in fact, typically, because what we, the path that I've got stored is, it's a graph, right? And it's a bunch of vertices in my configuration space and connections between those. Now, when I pull out that path, you almost will never actually precisely follow that path. That path should be viewed as essentially kind of a guide. So the, you will do some kind of, typically you'll do some kind of smoothing process to that or optimization to that path. You know, I would give you a path and then you can do whatever you wish with it to decide how you're gonna use it. But what we have stored is, yes, a graph. 